at you tonight, if you would, to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is where we're going to spend our time this evening. You know, much of history seems to shape, be shaped by kings and governments and armies. And yet, behind the scenes, hidden from our human eyes, God and his agents are work, or at work, rather I should say, as the true shapers of the events that are taking place all around us. Were you to read the events that are recorded for you beginning in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 23, from the perspective of a historian outside of Scripture, just looking at it through his eyes, much of the detail would be lost as to what truly happens, what is going on there in that ancient place. You see, it's only through the lens of divine revelation that we're able to truly see the complete picture and what a picture it is. When you read these verses, it's interesting that there are several who play a part in our story tonight, but none of their names are given. For example, you're not given the name of the king of Syria at this particular time, or the king of Aram. His name, by the way, is Ben-Hadad II. Nor are you given the name of the king of Israel at this time. His name is Joram. You're not given the name, though he plays a significant part at one point in the story, you're not given the name of the servant of the prophet Elisha. No. You're not given the names of any of the officers in the army of Syria. The only person whose name is given is the name of the prophet of God, Elisha. He saw what others could not see because God allowed him to see the unseen. He is the one through whom God granted victory and through whom God raised up kings and took down kings tore them down. Tonight as we look at our story, when all is said and done, what we realize is that history is ultimately directed by one and only one, and that is the sovereign God that you and I serve. As we look at this story before us tonight, I have named it as you see before you, the prophet who saw the unseen. I think there some, are some valid and valuable insights that we can take away from this lesson. And I am looking forward to it. I have, as I was studying in preparation for it, there were some things I ran across. I thought, this is good. This is very good. So my prayer is that it might strengthen you and your faith and that it might cause you to render even greater service to him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So let's begin looking here in 2 Kings chapter 6. The first thing that we're introduced to is this relationship that exists or has existed between the king of Israel and the king of Aram or Syria. And what we find out is that it is alternated back and forth between times of peace and times of war, if you will. At this particular point, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad II, is making plans to raid Israel. And he's making preparation or discussing where he wants to pitch his camp, where he wants to place his camp. And yet God informs Elisha of the plans that the king is making, he in turn passes this information on to the king of Israel, warning him to beware. When the king of Israel, who is, as I said, Joram, learns this information, he checks out, sends someone to check out Elisha's information, finds that it is correct. So he prepares his troops so that the king of Syria cannot attack him. Each time, frustrating the king of Syria. As a matter of fact, we learn here by the time we get to verse 10 that this doesn't happen once. It doesn't happen twice. This happens several times. The result is that the king of Syria begins to think that the failure to be able to do anything to the Israelites is a result of somebody in his camp, in his inner circle, warning the enemy. There's a spy among them. There's a traitor, if you will, among them. So he calls his servants together, and he demands to know how this is true. As a matter of fact, he says in verse 11, Will you tell me which one of us is for the king of Israel? In, what, in other words, which one of you is giving away our secrets? And one of his servants informs him, It's not one of us. 
It's the prophet Elijah, or Elisha. He says, if you'll notice verse 12, he said, he tells the king the words that you speak in your bedroom. In other words, he told Ben-Hadad, Elisha knows your most private conversations. How? How does he know this? It wasn't because Elisha had a network of informers that were working inside the king's palace there in Syria and then coming back and telling him the king's plans. No, it was because God was revealing these things to him. God was informing his prophet of what was going on. You see, the king's problem is not another king. It's not a problem of another army. The problem is a prophet. One single solitary prophet. And he thinks, if I can do something about this prophet, then I can solve my problem. But as long as he remains a free man, I'm going to be unsuccessful in my attacks against Israel. So what does he do? He orders his officers to locate and to capture this prophet of Israel. Before long, they learn that Elisha is in a place known as Dothan. Dothan, they're not Dothan, Alabama, by the way. Dothan is a place about 10 miles north of the capital of North Israel, which is Samaria. And the king then sends along a rather large contingency of his army, which we are told here was composed of horses and chariots on a night raid in order to surround this town that we find Elisha is in. Now, by this point, maybe you're stopping to think about something. Has not the king of Syria been unsuccessful in all of his attempts to this point to attack Israel because of this prophet? Because this prophet is always forewarned and has gone and told his king what's going on. How in the world does he think that now he's going to send a large contingency of his soldiers to capture this prophet who already knows what he says as he puts it in his bedroom. The truth is, he's not. Have you ever stopped to think that Elisha already knew he was coming before he ever came that way? It didn't suddenly surprise Elisha that here it is. No doubt, Ben-Hadad did not believe that Elisha's ability to discern these things originated with the God of Israel. So he sends his contingency of soldiers, and early in the morning, they come or they, they surround the city in the night. Early in the morning, Elisha's servant has risen and, and gone outside and suddenly is confronted, as verse 15 tells us, with an army and chariots who have surrounded the city. He says to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Let me ask you to consider something. A question. Where is Elisha? Where is he? For years, I have assumed he was still inside, back in the house, and that the servant goes back inside to tell him this. Look at the text. I read five different translations. None of them indicate that Elisha is inside. None of them tell us that. All they tell us is that the servant says to Elisha, I want to submit to you that Elisha was not inside the house. Elisha was outside the house. Elisha knew exactly what was happening and showed no concern and no alarm for the events that were taking place in front of him. Have you ever stopped to consider that? That maybe Elisha was already outside, already doing whatever he had intended to do while all of this was taking place and he's just going about his regular business because he is unconcerned about what the king of Syria is doing with all of his soldiers. On the other hand, this servant is very alarmed at what he sees happening around him. Why is it that Elisha is not concerned? Why does he not demonstrate any alarm? 
It's because of what he knew and what he could see. Notice something he says to his servant. He says, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if you had been Elisha's servant at that point in time, what would you have been doing? I think I would have been looking around for the, those who are with us. Because I see those who are with them. And it's a large contingency of soldiers. But when it comes to us, I'm sorry, but Elisha, all I see is you and me. And that don't, that, my math may be outmoded, but two against all of them doesn't mean that there's more of us than there are of them. So where do you get that those who are with us are more than those who are with them? In order to calm his servant's fear, Elisha prays a short, simple prayer. O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. I love this part. Because suddenly the servant could see what Elisha had been seeing all along. And what the servant saw, as we see in verse 17, is a mountain that is full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I wish Hollywood could get it right. Because, folks, this, this, is, this would make a great if it were just adhere to Scripture and follow Scripture. You may remember that earlier, back in chapter 2, when Elijah, Elisha's master, the prophet that preceded Elisha, had been taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, there had also appeared something else. It was a chariot of fire and horses of fire. And when Elijah, or Elisha at that time saw them, he cried out, My master, he says, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. But now what we find is it's not one chariot being pulled by horses of fire. It is multiple chariots being pulled by multiple horses of fire. All of them. And they fill the mountain. And they outnumber the army of Syria. Even if they didn't outnumber the army of Syria, one would have been sufficient. While Elisha and his servant can see this great host of God, the army of Syria, the officers, the soldiers in that army do not see anything standing between them and Elisha. And so they began to converge on Elisha, on Dothan. They are coming for him. And notice what Elisha prays. He says, strike them with blindness, I pray. And that's exactly what God does. This once great army is now helpless, unable to discern which way to go. Now, whether it was a physical blindness where they just couldn't see anything at all in front of them, or it was more of a confusion in which they just didn't know what to do and were under the direction of Elisha, whatever it was, they were helpless against this one solitary prophet. And Elisha now takes control of the situation. He already had control of it. But notice what he says. He says to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will take you to the man you seek. He led them on a 10-mile march to the city of Samaria. I've always thought what a sight that must have been. Here's a lone prophet, maybe his servant is with him, I don't know, out front, leading this entire army of Syrian soldiers, following him along like a little puppy dog would follow its master. As he leads them to the very capital city of Samaria, don't you know, it had to have been a sight and imagine the surprise of the king of Israel when suddenly somebody comes, one of his watchmen comes to him and says, Oh king, you need to look down the road. You need to see what's coming our way. And he looks out and he sees this. 
and here comes a prophet, and behind him here comes this entire army. But they're not charging, they're just following right along. He leads them right through the city gates, inside the walls of Samaria. And then he prays another prayer. He prays again, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. Notice how similar that is to what he had prayed earlier for his own servant, open his eyes that he might see, open their eyes that they might see. They open, God opened their eyes, and suddenly, can you imagine their reaction when they realize where they're at? They're inside the city walls of the capital city of North Israel, and they are surrounded by the army of Israel, and they themselves are the captives, and they themselves are possibly looking at instant death. As a matter of fact, Joram, Israel's king, is no doubt pleasantly surprised and excited because just as they had been dropped at his doorstep or brought to his doorstep by Elisha, he turns and twice he asked Elisha, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha reminded the king that prisoners of war were not to be killed. And besides, these were not his prisoners. They were to be treated as guests. And then they were to be allowed to return home without being harmed. Joram listened to Elisha. And as we find in verse 23, he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them back home. And I love the last statement that is made in verse 23. Here's the way the New King James translates it. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. I wonder why. They knew they couldn't defeat the God of Israel and his prophet. What are we to take away from that? It's a great story. But what is in it for us? All these years removed, I think there are three things. The first is this. When we follow God's word, we have his divine protection. As long as the king of Israel listened to Elisha and diverted his troops, then they suffered no loss at the hands of Syria's army. And had he chosen to ignore Elisha's warnings and go ahead and do the things he had wanted to do, no doubt they would not have fared so well. But by listening to the prophet, he actually was protected. And the apostle Paul would write some 900 years later, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But you might ask, now wait a minute. What about when things don't seem to work out so well for God's people who are trying to do God's will and who are faithful to God? For example, what about Joseph? Joseph was doing God's will, but Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. And though he followed God and continued doing what was right, his lot in life seemed to go from bad to worse because he ended up eventually in prison. And yet, if you follow that story all the way to the end, if you don't stop somewhere in the middle, you find that God elevated him to the position of second in command of all of Egypt. And when he was united, reunited with his brothers, and they realized who he was, and they were afraid of him because of what he could now do to them, you may remember something he said to them that is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. He said, as for you, speaking to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this personal or present result to preserve many people alive. Sometimes God takes the bad that happens in our life. He's directing it in order to bring good out of it because there's something he is going to use us to accomplish or something he is going to do that involves us down the road. And what Satan intends for harm, what Satan may intend for bad or ill, God may bring good out of it. Or take Peter, that faithful apostle of Jesus who followed him and said, yeah, though everyone else may leave you, yet I will not. You may also remember that Satan at one time had wanted to, he had demanded to sift Peter like wheat. The way that it is put for us in Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. 
And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You see, God took something that Satan had intended and brought good out of it. Did Satan deny Jesus? Yes. Did Satan, I mean, did not Satan, did Peter deny Jesus? Yes. Did Peter go off and, and weep bitterly because of what he had done? Yes. Did Peter think that perhaps he was no longer worthy to follow Jesus? Maybe so, because Jesus specifically indicated after he had been raised from the dead, and the angel stipulated this, and tell Peter, and tell Peter, he wanted Peter to know that all was not lost. And perhaps this is why many years later, when Peter writes two letters of his own, he would write in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober or vigilant, be on the alert. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He knew what Satan had done to him. But you see, God used it and brought good out of it. And the truth is, we do not know we do not know all of the dangers that God has already preserved us from. We do not know what Satan has demanded of God to do to us that God has said no already. And I believe that God watches over us just as he watched over his prophet so long ago. The second thing that I take from this is this. God is present with us at all times. There is never a time when God is not present among us. When Elisha's servant could not see God's protection, until his own prophet, God is God's prophet, prayed that his eyes might be opened. Folks, it did not mean that that protection was not there, that it was not present. It's just that he couldn't see it. You and I are not given the eyes to see what God already has in place, excuse me, in place for us. And, and even before ascending back to the Father, you remember what Jesus says to his disciples? Matthew records it for us over in Matthew chapter 28, there in verse 20. He says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, I won't for now. He was talking to his disciples, but I believe he also intended that to be a message for each one of us. And remember, it was the apostle Paul who himself had suffered much for the cause of Christ as he brings about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there in verses 23 through 28. And yet he declared this that we find over in Romans chapter 8. He says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God is always present with us. And in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, we find these words. He himself has said, I will never leave you or desert you, nor will I forsake you. And the writer goes on to say, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? God is always present with us. He will not leave us alone. Does it mean that we will not suffer? No. It does not mean that. There will be times when we will suffer for being Christians. That is something that we are taught by the apostle himself. That all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But God will not forsake us in the midst of that. He is there with us. Even as he was with his prophet so long ago. And the last lesson that I think we take from this tonight is this. You and I as Christians must always continue to overcome evil with good. It is so easy to give in to evil and to respond to evil with other evil. You did something to me, I'm going to do it back to you. Only it's going to be worse when I do it to you than what you've done to me. That seems to be the way our society loves to, to live its life. But that is not the way God calls us to live our lives. The king of Israel and his army had the advantage over the army of Syria. They could have annihilated them right there within their city gates. And even if Elisha had given the word and said, yes, go ahead, do what you will with them, that is all that would have taken. But that is not what Elisha did because God had other plans. And God's 
prophet declared those plans to the king of Israel, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go on their way. As we've already noticed, the king obeyed Elisha's commands. He prepared a great feast for them when they had eaten and drunk. They were sent away. They went back to their master. Let me draw your minds or direct your minds to a passage of Scripture that's found in the book of Romans, chapter 12. Many of you have read it time and again in your personal Bible readings, but let me share it with you yet again. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Here's what Paul said. He said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What are we doing in our lives? How are we living our lives on a daily basis? Are we working to overcome evil with good? Do we believe that God is present with us all, at all times? And do we believe that God has our best interest at heart? That he is going to protect us. He's going to watch over us. Because he has promised he will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we are able to bear. But will with, it, that, with that temptation provide a way of escape that we might endure it. You and I serve a great God. We have opportunities that he gives us to do good in this community. And I want to challenge you to use the talents and the abilities and everything that God has given you to do great good in this community, to change lives in this community, knowing that God is watching over you. And even if we lose our lives in the process of doing His will, do we not still win? Yes. Because you see, there's a home that awaits us. What can man do to us? We have a Father who will say welcome home as he said to one of our brethren just a few days ago we live blessed lives we have a great God and we have an eternal home let's go about doing good and let's live for our God maybe today your life is not what it needs to be you're a Christian you wear the name but you know I'm not living that life and you know you need to change. If we need to pray with you or for you, we want to do that. We want to help you get back on track. Maybe you're here and you are not a Christian. You've not yet rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ. You've not yet repented of sin that separates you from God and been buried with Christ in baptism, having confessed His name, so that those sins might be washed away and you might start again. Why not tonight? I love that song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? Do not let the word depart. Close your eyes against the light. For sinner, harden not your heart. Oh, why not tonight? Is it tonight that you are ready to respond? If so, won't you come as together we stand and sing?